Hello everyone. Welcome to our lesson on prehistoric art. Before I get into some of the lesson, I'd like to ask a question that some of you might be asking now. Why study the history of art in a class called Art Appreciation? Well, um, I've studied art history for many, many years and gone, going from an early a pretty bad experience to an in-depth study that I continue to this day. And what I have found is that the more we learn about the history of art, the more that we can apply that to current art, art that we're looking at now in our class, and, and perhaps even art that you're creating in your own creative life. Let me tell you a story about my first art history class. I was an 18-year-old art student, you know, fresh out of high school. Um, this class was at a school in, in Florida, an art school where I was going. And it was three hours long. And it's hard to imagine, but there was no air conditioning. And it was so hot. I remember sitting there, and the teacher would get the room really dark. And he would put on slides, and he talked kind of like, wah, 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 wah. Oh, it was just torture. And at that time, I thought art history was about the most dismal subject ever. But since that time, as I've gone on to really live a full life as an artist, I've come to so appreciate what I call the history of the aesthetic impulse, which um, basically just means the desire to create beauty or to create forms that are pleasing to the eye. So as we study the remnants left by these various cultures, we can use our mind's eye to imagine what motivated people to go to such great lengths to make beautiful objects of art, even in prehistoric times, before they had a system of writing to record their history. So here's a test question for you. Prehistoric means before written history. So people create art for many reasons to express religious ideas or feelings, to make money or to express power, to beautify practical tools or implements, uh, plus there's many more reasons than I could list here. Although there are common threads that run throughout the history of making art, there's also really um, pretty profound differences in various cultures as to how artists were treated, how art functioned in that society, and what motivated people to make images or sculptures. Often in our study of art, we're left with more questions than answers. So our survey of art history is broken down into three sections. The first one we'll call the ancient world. Now at the end of each of our sections, we're going to have a test. And our ancient world section covers a time period beginning with prehistoric art on through the Roman Empire. Now the ancient world is going to cover the following major developments. We have the Neolithic period, which includes hunting and gathering and farming. We have the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, which this culture, they defined formal religion, they made a code of law, invented writing, numbers, mathematics, astrology, and they created architecture, architecture, sculpture, and painting, all flourished in the service of gods and kings. The sacred books of Judaism and Christianity were written, uh, and the state of Israel began. The Greeks, they defined what we know as Western intelligence, created the first democracy, and began scientific inquiry as we know it. With the Greeks, we have the birth of the importance of individual expression. Also, they really believed in the value of rational thinking, and we'll look at that a little bit. Oh, and then we have the Romans, who excelled in military might. They created a huge empire in which the local, occupied people participated in their own government. There's a notion called the Roman peace, which means troops are in place to keep warring people at peace. And it's still the goal of much of our foreign policy today, although it is a bit of a, of a paradox, isn't it, that you bring the army in in order to keep the peace. Now, it's fun to, as we consider these ancient cultures, I really encourage you to remember that we're studying human beings, much like ourselves, with the same basic human urges, the desire to find food, 
to raise family, and to have some kind of religious or spiritual expression. And by connecting with the humanity of the people that we study, we are, in a sense, studying ourselves as our ancestors have evolved through time. So let's look at prehistoric art. And as I said earlier, prehistory means before written history, before written language in any culture. Because many illiterate people, people who aren't writing, develop very complex societies, prehistoric does not mean primitive. One example would be the Native American people that remained a prehistoric society until well into the 16th century when European settlers brought a written language and that was adapted by some of the tribes. Yet the Native American cultures were very sophisticated in their cultures and traditions. But all that being said, let's go back to the beginning and look at art in the Stone Age. There's two terms I want you to learn, Paleolithic and Neolithic. They're easy to remember because what does Paleo mean? It means old. So Paleolithic really means old stone. And this begins about 40,000 BC until about 8,000 BC. This, um, but it varies because it's when the ice began to recede, the uh, Paleolithic period ended. Now with this period, we have the first sculptures. We have these really amazing mammoth bone houses. See below. Look at that little diagram. It's from mammoth bones. And we have uh, cave painting. So then we have the Neolithic period. And that's easy to remember because what does Neo mean? It means new. So the Neolithic period is newer than the Paleolithic period. So this is as the Ice Age is receding, farming begin begins. And with the development of agriculture, people began to settle into villages to raise livestock and such. And this really changed um, how they made art. The crafts developed. So let's talk for a moment about cave painting, which I just find amazing. So this is the earliest signs of human beings creating images, and it goes back about at least 35,000 years. One of the ways that the early people left their images behind was in the form of cave paintings. These early artists worked deep in hidden caves working only by dim lamps and toiling on these tall scaffolding built into the cave walls. Here they created beautiful artwork that seemed to have served probably a ceremonial purpose. Uh, it's, it's really a mystery actually. We don't know why they painted these paintings. Two of the caves that we're going to be looking at are in France. One is at Altamira and the other is at Lascaux. Now both of these caves were found by children. Lascaux was discovered in 1940 when three boys followed their dog into a hidden opening in the rock. Now I guess you could say that Lascaux was actually discovered by a dog, but nah, I don't know if that would go over well <clears throat> in, a, in a discussion where you're trying to sound intelligent about art history. But okay, Lascaux was discovered by a dog followed by children. But um, I digress. Let's look at the images here. Aren't they amazing? Okay, now look at the bottom one. See how it's sort of a mountain lion with another mountain lion and maybe a bear? And the way that they did these images, one on top of the other. Remember, these guys are, or women, I don't know, these painters are painting with these little bitty lamps. And we're going to look at the lamps in a moment. Very dim light, deep in a cave. And they got this incredible detail. So cave painting is a very mysterious form of art. The people who painted these images walked hundreds of feet into dark caves, lighting their way with dim lamps that burned animal fat on wicks that were made of moss. They constructed scaffolding which allowed them to paint high above the floor of the cave, and they often lived on these scaffolds for days at a time as they painted large pictures of animals. Now, it's believed that there was some kind of a religious or spiritual significance to these animals because they often made one right on top of another. Maybe they were getting ready to hunt and they felt like they would, you know, bring the spirit of the animal forth. Some of them have marks where apparently spears were thrown at the walls. Well, something was thrown at the walls to make marks. Um, 
the image above shows the life of a horse or it shows repeated images of a horse. Look here, I love the rhino. This is one of the most famous ones. See how the rhino's sort of in motion? They did it over and over again. I mean, I just find this uh, fascinating. So both of these images are from the cave at Lascaux in France. And we have a video this week about Lascaux. Now, the artists of Lascaux painted very realistic animals, but they, look at these humans. This is a guy. That's as close as they got to a realistic human. On the other hand, here's one very rare image from the Sahara of more realistic people that was found in the caves. But really, the, the theory goes that because they gave some kind of a spiritual significance to these animals, they preferred not to paint humans in that way. Maybe it would steal their spirit or something like that. So before we move on, let's just look a little bit at what they actually did. Okay, use your mind's eye to imagine this. Look at the top lamp, or top piece of stone here, right here. This one is typical. They would actually find numerous ones of these um, kind of stone lamps all around a painting site. The one on the bottom is more special, would be um, less common, but they use these also. Now these lamps were filled with animal fat and they used moss for the wicks. I mean, as I look at it, that's pretty scary to go with such a primitive lamp way into a cave in order to paint a picture. So. And they really were risking their lives to make this art. Isn't that amazing? All right, now let's talk pigments. Some of you I know are in painting class or will take painting, and a pigment is simply the colors. What they would use for their pigments would be um, what we see here on the right. They would be charcoal or pigment which was made from stones that they found often right around the caves. In fact, that helped determine the location of the caves would be if they could find colorful pigments near the entrance. They made brushes of chewed sticks. They used their hands. Often, these early painters would leave behind handprints. Now, another thing that they did that was interesting was they would make blowguns out of hollow reeds and put pigment into the blowgun and then blow it using their hand as a sort of stencil and leave the handprints. I That's some of my favorite images and it's what's on um, one of our home pages this week because we're actually seeing the hands of these artists that were working 20 or 30,000 years ago. Now many of these caves are really no longer available for people to see because uh, as soon as human beings were introduced back into the caves after they'd been in the dark for all these years, of course we're humans and we bring with us dust and organisms and mold and all sorts of things that immediately began to degrade these paintings. So what they've done at Lascaux is they've made a, a FACO cave that's just like the original but isn't going to deteriorate and the original remains sealed. All right, let's move on and talk about other things. Here are some examples of more portable functional art. This one on the right is called oops, Venus of Willendorf. But really, nowadays, to be politically correct, you would call her Woman of Willendorf because Venus is some kind of a projection put on by later people. This is a very interesting sculpture because she's just uh, about two and a half, three inches tall, and she's everywhere. I mean they have found hundreds of these sculptures all over Europe. They found them in China. Um, these little bitty figurines that apparently were carried as fertility symbols. That's our guess. Now to the right, uh, to the left of the Willendorf, oh by the way remember her. Remember Venus of Willendorf or Women from Willendorf because she will come back to you. Um, I love these bone flutes. As someone who loves to play music, you know, I find it so endearing that the early artists created flutes to play music by. And right now, we are at the end of our 15 minutes for this presentation, but tune in. Part two is coming up next. Thanks for listening, and be sure to listen to part two because it's even more fascinating than this one. All right.